right. Um, hello to everyone. Dumelang Sanbonani, Habari Ajioni, Karibu Sana to all of you, wherever you're joining us from today. Welcome to the fifth dialogue convened by the Being African in Africa initiative. This initiative seeks to bring positive content and narratives about our beloved continent, Africa. I'd like to open the session with a quote from Kwame Nkrumah. Most of you are aware of him. He used to be the former president of Ghana. On the 8th of August in 1960, to be exact, he said, and I quote, it has often been said that Africa is poor. What nonsense. It is not Africa that is poor. It is the Africans and they are impoverished by centuries of exploitation and domination. That is why we are poor. It is a product of history. It was caused by man, and therefore it can be addressed by man. That's what Kwame Nkrumah said long ago in 1960. I like the last part, our problems are caused by men and therefore can be addressed by men. Today, we are bringing you entrepreneurs and academics who are doing just that to address those problems as men and women as they have been caused by men and women historically. These entrepreneurs and academics are hustling and they believe in the potential and power of entrepreneurship to address Africa's economic challenges. If you think about it, entrepreneurship is not new to Africa, is it? I was having a laugh, a laugh a couple of days ago that my maternal grandmother can qualify as an entrepreneur as well. She raised all 12 of her children uh, without any formal education or any office space, anything fancy like that, but she made transactions agriculturally and managed to raise all 12 of her children. So we have an exciting lineup for you today. We have uh, Dr. Grieve Chelwa from UCT. We have Mark Edward Murimbika from the Vitz Business School. We have entrepreneurs as well who are still at it as we speak, Barbara Kalima Piri and Sheila Afari, two women who are doing really fantastic stuff um, in their side hustles. So I would like to encourage you to engage. This session is for you. Please feel free to share your comments, ask questions, and benefit from this as much as you can. Post your comments and questions using the chat function. If you look at the bottom of your screen, most of you should have access to the chat function. You can ask even when the speaker is talking. We have dedicated some time to engage with you at the end and answer all your questions to make sure you can come out of this very satisfied. The session is being streamed on Facebook. It's going to be available on YouTube as well. So we're going to share with you the YouTube link to watch at a later stage and share with your own networks because after all, this is for all Africans. So let's get straight into it. This session that we've created for you. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Grieve Chelwa. As I said, he's from UCT. He's a senior lecturer in economics at the Graduate School of Business at UCT. Um, he's also the co-director of the MBA program. And from 2016 to 2017, he was a postdoc fellow at the Center for African Studies um, at, How at Harvard University. So Dr. Griev Chelwa, Karibu Sana, the stage is yours. Um, Louis, if we can just help Grief, he's on mute. Thank you. Somebody has just unmu unmuted me. Uh, Asante Sana for that welcome, Kara. And uh, thanks so much to Mwanja and uh, everybody else who's uh, involved in putting together this important dialogue. I think we need dialogues like this, right? So this is really important. And thanks so much for asking me to speak on this particular important topic. Uh, so as Kara has said, I'm an academic, uh, in many ways a theoretician, and as you know, we can't make sense of the world without an, an understanding of theory. At least we have a set of facts in the world. We need to sort of understand those facts of the, in the world by having a theoretical framework. So what I thought I would do this evening 
is really just give an overview of the, from a theoretical and even empirical point of view, the importance of entrepreneurs for Africa's economic development, why we need entrepreneurs. Uh, and then I'll speak from that conceptual level and then my colleagues will come in later on with much more practical uh, uh, pieces of uh, experiences and evidence. All right, so what I want to do is pretty much sort of frame the discussion around why is entrepreneurship important, right? Africa needs to develop. I, I don't need to say this to anybody else. Uh, if you're African, you know that the urgency of development is there. We need to develop. We need to move hordes of our people out of poverty. We need to increase incomes of our people. We need to create jobs. We need to build hospitals. And to do that, we need to develop. Uh, and I'll sort of uh, explain why entrepreneurship is really important for that developmental process. What I'll then do is I'll try to talk about what is the state of entrepreneurship on the continent as it is now, right? So what is the state of entrepreneurship on the continent as it is now? Uh, and then I will conclude with some policy implications of some of the facts that I, I will discuss. So let's start at the beginning, right? So what is the role of entrepreneurship in economic development? Why do we need entrepreneurs uh, to drive our development uh, agenda? Uh, to answer this question, we first of all need to understand how economic development happens. So how have economists theorized the process of economic development? How does development happen? So historically, economic development has happened as a result of what is called structural transformation. So if you look at all instances in history of countries, societies, regions that have developed, they have developed as a result of what is called structural transformation. Structural transformation essentially means that economies structurally change from relying on primary commodities to relying much more on manufacturers slash industry. And then subsequently in maturity, they begin to rely much more on services. So really this is what we've learned from history. The only source, the only empirically grounded source of economic development is to structurally transform our economies by relying much a continent that's heavily dependent on agriculture for economic output. And most of our people uh, rely primarily on agriculture, right? So the idea of agriculture in a relative sense, not in a sense, moving away from agriculture to a second stage of manufacturers. And then subsequently when our economies are much more mature, in services. This is really has been the story, uh, historical story of uh, economic development. So we seem to be having a, a network challenge. Dr. Griff, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? It, it broke off. So just pick it up from your last sentence, please. All right. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this uh, at the end. This is again, one of the challenges of entrepreneurship in Africa. So I'm speaking to you from Lusaka. The electricity has gone out because the national utility has cut electricity. So I'm running on um, what you call uh, backup batteries, but this is a challenge really of entrepreneurship. Anyways, so do stop me, Kara. Let me know when you've lost me and then I'll repeat the sentence. All right. Okay, so pretty much I was saying that economic development happens via this process of structural transformation. It turns out that as you move people off the land and then move them into a manufacturing sector or an industrial sector, this is what drives the process of economic development because then they get access to more capital, they get access to much more technology, they become much more productive and that drives wages and that's economic development. But, um, much of what we call the developed countries they are heavy on services where at some point in their history, they had a big manufacturing sector, right? So this has been the experience of the industrialized countries. And that is why we call them industrialized countries, precisely because we realize the importance of structurally transferring to an industrial manufacturing sector to drive uh, economic development. It has been the experience of the so you know, South Korea, China. Uh, Dr. Yes. 
Okay, we lost you again, but um, you can continue. Do is I'll turn off my video. That might help conserving bandwidth. Right? Okay, let's try that. Okay, so uh, I was just saying this has been the story of uh, industrialized countries. This has been the experience of countries like Bangladesh and Vietnam that are slowly transitioning into industrial centers of the world. So structural transformation away from the primary sector is particularly crucial for economic development. Structural transformation. Now the question is, what has all this to do with entrepreneurship, right? What has all this uh, process of, of uh, structural transformation to do with entrepreneurship? Uh, okay, so from the story told above, the one about structural transformation and the importance of manufacturing and industrial uh, sector, a key part of structural transformation is a movement towards manufacturing and industry, and then subsequently services. It is in these stages of transformation where the need for entrepreneurs is at its greatest, right? So the story here is that we need to set up manufacturing firms, we need to set up industry, and it is in this process of structurally transforming our people away from primary sectors onto a manufacturing sector that we need entrepreneurs, right? Uh, the experience of those countries that have industrialized is an experience of small scale entrepreneurs who subsequently become large conglomerates. So name them, uh, Daewoo, uh, Hyundai, um, uh, Toyota, Nissan, name all these firms. These are firms that are now large conglomerates that started out as small entrepreneurial outfits. And then as they were growing, as these firms were growing, they were also structurally transforming their own economies and therefore uh, driving uh, the process of development, right? So this is really the story. And I'll make a case uh, at the end that this process did not happen automatically. So uh, Daewoo or Hyundai or, or whatever the case may be, did not magically become a large conglomerate. There's a very big presence of government. I'll make that case later in, in, in the end. Right. There's a lot of evidence, especially from the US, where they track these figures quite closely, that entrepreneurship is responsible for the vast array of new jobs that are created. Right. Just think for a second, if you will, the number of direct and indirect jobs created by the likes of Facebook, Google, Apple, Airbnb, Uber, Twitter, etc. over the last 20 years. You cannot tell a story about job creation in the US over the last 20, 30 years without alluding to these firms, which are big now, but started out as small scale entrepreneurial outfits, right? They started out in garages, in people's bedrooms, but then they grew. The question, the lessons we need to learn is how did they grow, uh, right? Given some of the facts that I'll, I'll, I'll provide in a second. So I've really laid out the case for how economic development happens and the importance of having entrepreneurs in that process of economic development. This is how economic development happens and the role, crucial role that entrepreneurs play in that process of economic development. They set up these firms that will transition us away from primary uh, sector dependence onto manufacturing and subsequently services. Now, I would like to characterize the state of entre entrepreneurship or at least entrepreneurial firms in Africa, right? So where are we uh, as from an entrepreneurship point of view on the African continent? To do this, I'll borrow uh, some, some work from a, a bunch of people who study entrepreneurship in Africa. Uh, so a paper by Schleifan Laporta that came out in 2014 and another one by David McKenzie and his colleagues that came out in 2019. So these guys have studied pretty much the state of entrepreneurship on the African continent and they do uh, derive some facts, right? Where are we as a continent in so far as entrepreneurship is concerned? The first fact is that most Africans are entrepreneurs. All right. uh, unbeknownst to most of the, us, we are all entrepreneurs. And this is a result of the large informal sector, right? This is a result of the large informal sector, right? If you think about a typical African country, the informal sector is as large as half of the economy, right? Even larger sometimes. So informal sectors are large in South Africa, right? And many of our people are engaged in the informal sector. Therefore, many of our people are entrepreneurs by default, right? In the West, you get entrepreneurs by choice. And I think this is sort of the theme of the discussion this afternoon about sort of hustling, right? Many of us tend to hustle by default precisely because of survival reasons, right? And it can be, but anyways, many of our people are entrepreneurs by default. 
informal sectors are huge in, in many places uh, with informal activity, almost half of the economy. So many of first fact is that most Africans are entrepreneurs. This is the first fact. We are entrepreneurs. So nobody should say that Africans are not enterprising. By default, we are precisely because of a large informal sector. The second fact is that many of our entrepreneurial entrepreneurs and the firms that they run are small, unproductive, and stagnant. Now, it is important to con contextualize this fact, right? And I'll contextualize it later. I'll try to explain some of these facts. But this is a fact that many of our entrepreneurs run very small firms, on average, four employees versus 126 employees in the formal firms, right? So many of our, of, our, of our entrepreneurs are running small firms that are unproductive and that are stagnant, right? Which is a problem for this process of economic development. But I'll contextualize that. Another fact is that these firms, our informal firms, sadly rarely become formal, right? 90% uh, of informal firms continue being informal well into the future. It is important to contextualize these particular facts and I'll contextualize them in a second, right? So those are some of the uh, facts that have come out of the work of Schleif and Laporta. Most of our people are entrepreneurs, even though they don't call themselves that, but they are by default. The second fact is that most of our entrepreneurial firms are small, unproductive and stagnant. And productive really means from an economist's point of view, it doesn't mean that they're not producing stuff. They're just producing very little given what they're putting in. And this can be a function of access to capital technology. I will sort of contextualize this quickly. Uh, what about- I have some... a, a minute left, uh, Dr. Chela. All right, I'll wrap it up in a second. Uh, very quickly, thank you. Uh, the last set of facts that I wanna share with you is some uh, facts on firm survival, right? So we need to understand if we're going to do policy uh, in favor of entrepreneurship, we need to understand how our firms, entrepreneurial firms doing in terms of survival and such and such, right? Uh, so some facts are this. Um, most entrepreneurial firms that are founded in Africa, about half of them will fold up within five years. I'll contextualize this fact. About half of the entrepreneurial firms that are founded will fold up within five years. Uh, which firms are more likely to fold up? Younger firms are more likely to fold up with the first year being particularly precarious. Retail firms tend, tend to be particularly vulnerable. So you're thinking about your tax shops, your spaza shops in, in South Africa. These tend to be particularly vulnerable. Younger and older entrepreneurs tend to face the highest risk of fold up than those in the middle ages. The reasons for this, younger firms is inexperienced. Uh, I mean, younger entrepreneurs is inexperienced. Older entrepreneurs, obviously, they're at the end of their life. There's all these kinds of things that come to do with being much older, but folks in the middle tend to be very successful, obviously having, after having learned uh, golden experience and that kind of stuff. Ford up rates are higher for female entrepreneurs than male entrepreneurs, reflecting the patriarchal biases of most of our societies. Of the entrepreneur firms. Okay, very quickly now, why are, do we have these dismal uh, statistics? Very quickly, why do we have these dismal statistics? Uh, Lack of large-scale government support. I don't need to tell the entrepreneurs in the room this. We know that in Africa, you're on your own as an entrepreneur. No capital, no markets, no training or capacity building, no reliable public goods provision, reliable electricity, reliable healthcare, all these kinds of things uh, explain some of those dismal facts there. Also, our school curriculums need to change to emphasize the importance of entrepreneurship in economic development. Also, entrepreneurship is just very, very difficult. And I think my colleagues who will speak later will uh, allude to that. So really, if we want to change the entrepreneurial environment on the continent, there's room for large scale government intervention to resolve many of these issues. So Kara, that was my talk. I hope you uh, learned something from it and I, um, I will sort of wait, wait at the end for some question and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grieve. In fact, there was a request um, if you can share your presentation or your talk since we were having challenges with the, the audio. So that request has come through already. But everyone, Dr. Grieve is still here. So please fire away your, your questions and comments from him. We really want you to, to benefit from this session. So what he's saying there is that structural transformation is crucial and in Africa, a lot of us are entrepreneurs by, by default. It's definitely not a new term, not a new industry on this continent. The trick is now how to formalize it and allow entrepreneurs to survive and let their businesses thrive. So now I'm going to call upon uh, Dr. Mark Edward Murumbika. He's actually going to speak to you 
about the importance of side hustles and give you some encouragement and, and tips as well, what you can do to formalize and uh, make your businesses thrive. Dr. Murumbika is an entrepreneur and an academic as well. He has lived in many parts of the world, especially in Africa. He's a practitioner, a scholar in the field of entrepreneurship and new venture creation, strategic management and archaeology. So he is a senior lecturer at the Vitz Business School and he teaches these modules. Uh, Dr. Murumbika, everyone's very excited to hear from you. Ribusana. Thank you, Kara. Um, uh, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Um, we, we now operate on a 24 hour, and I'm sure it's morning to some uh, to, to some of the people on the, uh, in, in this room, and uh, it will be evening and afternoon in different parts of the world. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, what I am going to do is uh, I'll, I'll uh, broadcast my, my, my presentation. Um, uh, so that hello oh yes let me let me take it to take from from here right um Kira can uh, you 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 can share the 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 the, the presentation with, uh, with, with 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 the audience when later on that's why I prepared it and uh, for so. What I'm going to do is my talking points will be uh, looking up at side hustles. We, we, we like to use the term uh, hustling, be a hustler, I'm a hustler. You hear it a lot in, 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 in pop language uh, and uh, in street lingo. And uh, I believe that it could be uh, a pathway to mainstream entrepreneurship. Then I would um, briefly look up at opportunities for entrepreneurship in Africa. And I do not need to, uh, to, 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 to labor the point. Uh, um, Grieve just highlighted the challenges which uh, Africa faces as a continent. Those are where the entrepreneurial opportunities lie already. And I'll share my experiences as an, an entrepreneur. As Kara said, um, I have taught at business school for, for 10 years, but teaching at, at a business school was my side hustle because I've been running firms uh, all my life. Uh, I've I've never taken up a formal, a, a, a formal job in any organization, but unless I'm, I was involved in creating that company or contributing to, uh, to, to, to the being of that entity. Um, based on that, I would share a few, uh, a, a, a few sessions and lessons on, on, on that. Uh, before I go into my discussion, I'd like you to, wherever you are, look at the, the, the if you look up at my presentation, you'll see number one, there is an image. Just write what you think that image is. You can share in the chat group. Then try to answer that question. What, what are societal trends that you are seeing wherever you are, regardless of uh, your, your geographical location? What do you actually think are the global uh, society transformation factors um, uh, uh, today? Then I would, uh, I would address uh, what you would have written and what even at the end of my, my talk. When you think of hustling or entrepreneurship, um, you would notice that entrepreneurship can best be explained by that formula I put up there. Uh, entrepreneurship is a function of entrepreneurs. Without the entrepreneurs, there is no entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship cannot, um, uh, it becomes or becomes into being by action. Somebody has to take action. Individuals have to take action, which then we say, we have entrepreneurship and this one is entrepreneur. You cannot be an entrepreneur if you have not created any, anything. You cannot be an entrepreneur if you have not created value. Um, you can't be an entrepreneur by having ideas sitting up in your head. So the, the whole idea of uh, hustling is your ability to see uh, uh, things within your community or within your individual space where you can say, can I do something about this? If you can do something about it, it means you are creating value. Because if you don't do it, that will not, the result will not come up. And there are many of us can share the whole experience of saying, uh, you wake up one day and you see something and say, but I have been thinking about it. And yet you did not take action and somebody else took action and they're probably doing it so badly, but yet it's working. That's the, the whole point. When you think of hustling, you're looking up for 
something which can help you in whatever state you are. Either you are in a job which is not paying you well, then you decide I need to make extra money somewhere else, or you are unemployed, you think you need to, uh, to, 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 to be doing small things uh, as you look for a job. There's so many reasons why you could, but at the end of the day, it's all about identifying a need in wherever you are. That need becomes the opportunity. Identifying an opportunity and being a let opportunities is not enough. You would have to create a solution. That's what we call innovation. Ability to create solutions, which you can then implement in order to create value. You can implement by creating a venture. You can implement by starting in your, in your garage or in someone else's garage, uh, start coding in someone else's garage, start selling tomatoes, or processing tomatoes into, 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 into tomato pads. But you can't be an entrepreneur if you see uh, uh, 10 of your neighbors are selling tomatoes by your gate and you go and join them. You are lacking three things which are considered to be critical when you think of going through uh, 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 entrepreneurship. You have to be innovative. That's a, so your solution must be unique. You have to be proactive. You also have to have a certain risk propensity because it's not a walk in the park. Eventually, you must also think, if, you are, if it's a small venture you are doing or a side hustle you are doing, what is the end game? What is your long-term strategy? Are you just punching in the dark as you go? Or you have a harvest point. You would say, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm at university, I, I would experiment. If it fails, fine, I'm still a student. As long as I'm not failing, I'll continue with my degree. Uh, if it works, you learn a lot of lessons and make some money on, on, on the, or make impact. Because entrepreneurship is not all about making money. It's also about changing lives. You could be a social entrepreneur who is looking up at improving lives of others. There must be a harvest strategy. There must be a harvest at the end of, 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 of the day. There are many reasons why I would hustle, isn't it? Financial, practical reason I'm unemployed or I'm not happy with the employment. Or I start experimenting with uh, some, some things I could be doing whilst I'm at work because my work is demanding and I'm not happy at this, so I'm looking for balanced life. Or it could be a whole life plan, self-actualization. That has been my motivation since university. Once I experimented as a student, starting up adventures as a student, it worked. And I thought, I can actually do this the rest of my life. But strangely, because I was succeeding in creating things and failing, it also motivated me to stay in, 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 in education. I, I am a perennial student. I have acquired double PhDs, several masters, several postgraduate. I am currently studying another degree in education. And because of that, I am in a position where I constantly in touch with what is changing in the world, what is happening. Uh, and I have reached a point where I need to attain societal value and impact. So education and teaching and mentoring and is part and parcel of my journey to self-actualization. Uh, and I can do this. I have the luxury of doing this at this point in time because I've spent 25 years running businesses, creating them, failing, succeeding, and all that. Those which failed had less impact than those which succeeded. And that's what life is all about. Most of us, we take life like, we, if I get a job, if I'm lucky I get a job, you work so hard and you take weekends or you take leave. That's where you would go and you do things you love, your leisure, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, what about thinking of it differently? Right now, we are working from home because of COVID restrictions. Our work has infiltrated our lives to a point where it's hard to start separating work from actual life. That's an environment for hustling. You can do things you love within the work environment, within finding how you're going to deal with the issues of things, of relaxation, your sports, music, exercise. They must all manage without separating work from leisure. What you must consider as leisure might actually be the thing which would lead you to, uh, to, 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 to massive success. If you think of, um, uh, Greaves talk, spoke about uh, societies which develop uh, into complexity are the ones which are considered as developed, which are considered as economically and socially uh, advanced. And the definition of uh, most of these, or the easier way of looking at them, is the industrial revolutions, first, second, third, and fourth. And I ask the question, has this had been an opportunity or a test for Africa? It, 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 it depends on how we will take this going forward. Because all along, all the three industrial revolutions which have happened have been a case to Africa. The first industrial revolution, Africans um, started fighting and capturing each other and selling each other into slavery so that we would feed labor to feed the industrial revolution, first industrial revolution which was happening in Europe and America. 
Then the second time, we went into the second industrial revolution, which is uh, your, your, engine, your combustion engine came in, electricity, telephone, and all that. What happened to Africa during that period? Again, it was a curse because instead of exporting slaves, we started exporting all the natural resources. So slavery started taking place locally and hence colonialism. Third industrial revolution, when we started talking about the current digital, digital technology emergence of computers and all that uh, from the post second world war, we were fighting for liberation and we're getting liberation that we can excuse. Now we're in fourth industrial revolution, what do you think? You would have to tell me what do you think whether revolutions which have happened in the world have been a curse or an opportunity for Africa, and it depends on how we want, we want to take it forward. If we continue with what happened in the first and second and third, it might turn out to be a curse as well. But all these revolutions, what do they have in common? Efficiency in energy, efficiency in communication, and efficiency in transport. No economy can develop without efficiency in all three, on those three sectors. All the industrial revolutions which have happened have been driven by energy, communication, and transport. And there lies the massive gap for Africa. Massive, massive gap. We do not have uh, adequate energy, no adequate communication, no transport. So as things are going, this fourth industrial revolution might turn up to be a, a curse. This kind of, this revolution was marked by the internet uh, coming up from 1983, but the revolution started in the late 60s which led to what we are dealing with today, big data and analytics and all that. And with all these other industrial technologies you're coming here, 3D printing, renewable energy, internet of things, nanotechnology, robotics and all that. What is Africa's role in all these? What are we doing? Are we generating, a, even, even if, if we talk today about health, the whole world is talking about vaccinations and all that. And Africans are looking at, oh, well, let's wait for COVAX to donate. We'll wait for donation and yet, we have every resource which we should be leveraging on, but it's not happening because uh, we do not have adequate entrepreneurial thinking and systems within the, the, our, our governance, right? Then let I move on to tips on how to succeed as an entrepreneur. It's basically about perseverance, hard work, and uh, a lot of um, uh, personal character. And you have to ask yourself things like, is it achievable? For example, you could ask, if I, if I start selling tomatoes, do I have customers? And yet everyone else is selling tomatoes. Why don't you change that? Instead of selling tomatoes, why don't you wait for their tomatoes to start to get uh, 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 too, 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 too ripe and they'll be about to throw them away? And you buy those cheaper and convert them into tomato puree, tomato sauce, because no one has a tomato sauce in the, in, in the neighborhood. That's where ideas and diversion comes in. That's where you start creating. There's a whole term which is called Bone Global. Companies which are created in certain locations, but they don't sell anything in their locations where they are created. They sell elsewhere in other countries. And Africa is sitting up in that opportunity where we can start adding value to our resources and all that. Then is it affordable? Start thinking about your three apps, your friends, family, and fools who would support you at the beginning because you need that network. And Africa is very good at family support. Although we also have a challenge in how to convert that social network into business. Uh, think of attractiveness, is it attractive? Can I act on this? Can it bring value? Can I make money? Can I make impact? Then one of the biggest challenges of entrepreneurship in Africa is also the question of ethics. Is it appropriate? We've been dealing with uh, the whole test of COVID um, uh, uh, vaccinations and all that. And people are skeptical because Africa has had a bad experience with things being experimented on us and all that. So as an African entrepreneur, you also have to think about appropriateness and that. Passion will take you somewhere. But I would argue that I am able at this point in time to pursue my passion in things like education and all. Not because that's what has made me uh, the value which I've created. No, it's because what else I have done has created surplus value where, and which allows me to go into, uh, uh, into, into things like uh, education, which is my passion. But if I had not created that value, I could not have survived um, and I could not have pursued my passion. I asked this question earlier on and said, um, what do you see when you look up in this picture? Um, and what are the societal, uh, uh, so, and I'm sure that when you look up at what uh, anyone would have written in there, probably others, some, some of you would have said, well, I can see a gate. And as we see, they say, get without a fence, they can see a park, you can see trees. All those are actually in this picture. But what makes us think that this is a gate? 
What makes you think that this is a gate at all? Because we are conditioned to see things that way. So if you have, as an entrepreneur, the first thing which must come to your mind should be the unusual. Someone could have said, oh, this is a site which Mark Edward committed suicide. And since Mark Edward was a superstar, this has become a tourist attraction. It has nothing to do with the gate, but it's, it's important because it's a site which Mark Edward committed suicide and Mark Edward was a superstar. And tourists come to, to visit that whole place. Think of the unusual. Look at di things differently. And the same question I asked, what are the common societal trends transforming the globe? Others would have written, oh, okay, the internet, uh, COVID is affecting the world. All those things are true, but all of them can be found in four elements, which are called dead trends, demographic trends, population movement, why African youth are dying, trying to get to Europe and all that. It's because they're not getting the value they need here, so they think they would get the value in Europe. But all those who have gone to Europe would tell you that a lot of Africans who then end up in Europe do not find that joy which they were looking for, especially if you went there through the illegal means, you were not going there to education, for education or a, a job guaranteed. Even if you majority of Africans end up doing these low, low jobs. If you talk of all the happenings in the world, the fact that Africa cannot afford the, 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 the drugs and the drugs are being hoarded by developed countries, it's all about self-preservation of their demographic structure. Then expertise trend. You, aside the hustling is critical, it should come natural and second nature because there is no one who is going to be born today who's going to spend six, 40 years working in one job. That has gone, that will not happen again. That's a, a, an industrial era which has passed. You must be multi-skilled. You must be multi-expertized. Have different expertise, have different questions, different things that you follow. I can teach anything from business, I can teach archaeology, I can teach pathology because I'm a pathologist, I'm an archaeologist, I'm, and all these areas have also created businesses. I'm studying education, higher education, why? Because I, I would like to be able to start participating in decolonization of African education, and how do I do that? I can create ventures in that area, but I need to understand. Then you look at uh, things like attention trends. If you don't dance, one, people- One minute, Dr. Murumbika. Thank you, thank you. If you don't dance, people's attention goes away because of the media, because of uh, uh, the, the life will be so fast. That's why even we find a lot of our society members becoming victims of what we call fake news, what we call misinformation, because people are looking for things to consume, information to consume, and the information is being generated fast and being consumed faster. Attention deficit is a global issue and it's a global problem, regardless of how complex society is. And if we look at the United States, what has been happening there, you can, you can appreciate this. And the same is happening in Africa. If we do not hustle to make sure that the 1.4 billion Africans create a consolidated market and pays attention to what is happening in Africa, then we will not be able to create a consolidated society which can meet what uh, Grieve was talking about, looking up at a developed society. Africa has that potential. Then we've got the democratic trend. It's not about, I'm not talking about elections and people voting and all that. I'm talking about people now having access to information at any point, to a point where, which empowers them to make different decisions. And this democratic trend means a child in Mali can sit and consume the same information which I'm consuming when I sit in South Africa. When I sit in London, as long as they have access to the technology and they have access to the tools to do so. And yet in Africa, we are still far behind. All these trends, if you look at them, in any trend of those dead trends, you'll find opportunities. You just need to change the perspective on how we look at, 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 at things. Instead of seeing gaps, we must see something else. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I Thank hope you would have a lot of... Uh, entrepreneurial endeavors and would meet in the, in, 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 in the entrepreneurial space. Don't be afraid to be the sole bird which flies away from the flock. I like that very much. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody is nodding their heads. I like what you said. You can't be an entrepreneur with the idea in your head. You need the action as well. We are all thinking about many things. It's all in the actions. And just to summarize your steps is to identify a need create a solution, create value, and then be able to harvest um, the long-term strategy. So thank you very much. Dr. Murimbika is still around. So please do go ahead and post your 
your comments and questions. We will do all of that once all the speakers are done, but you can go ahead and share your comments and questions right now. So coming up next, we are going to speak to two ladies who are entrepreneurs. They're, they have young businesses that they're still hustling on today as we speak. The first one is uh, Barbara Kalima Piri, who most of you may be familiar with. Um, she is the CEO and founder of Udongo Detergents Company, which is in Zambia and in South Africa as well. And they say, and correct me if I say this wrong, Barbara, Udongo ni umoyo, which means cleanliness is life. And that's what Barbara is doing today. So she's going to tell us her story. Uh, Barbara Kalima Piri Karibusada. Thank you very much, Kara. Uh, I am extremely, extremely excited to be part of this online uh, platform. Um, I think it's an important platform because it is changing the narrative about Africa by Africans and how Africans are experiencing and uh, seeing Africa. So thank you to you, Mwanja, for uh, really birthing such a great um, uh, platform. Kera, you spoke it very well, udongo ni umoyo. Udongo means cleanliness, umoyo means life. So at Udongo, we do believe that um, a clean and germ-free environment is a, a good environment. It is a healthy environment, actually. So udongo ni umoyo. When you leave this place, you forget everything else, just remember udongo ni umoyo. But before I tell my story about how udongo started, um, I just want to mention four points. And, um, I think these four points are quite uh, critical. And some of them were highlighted by the previous speakers, but I'll just underscore some of them. So the first one is that um, being an entrepreneur is hard. And I think Dr. Grieb did mention this. It is so hard, colleagues, it is so hard. You make a lot of sacrifices, but it is worth it. It is worth it economically, personally, physically, emotionally, everything, it is worth it, although it's hard. The second one is that it's important to make money as an entrepreneur, but um, we need to make sure that we empower others along the way. The third one is that um, we need to believe in entrepreneurs. We need to grow entrepreneurs. We need to believe in what they are doing. And I think Dr. Grieb did mention the whole benefit of why uh, having entrepreneurs in an economy is critical. So we need to buy you know, products from our own entrepreneurs. We need to promote them. We need to talk about them. We need to advertise them. You know, we need to move away from a, a, a position where we uh, want to buy foreign stuff. Entrepreneurs will not grow. And I think the cost of not growing entrepreneurs is quite large for our economy. The fourth one is that um, all of us need to be entrepreneurs. And I think uh, Dr. Mugisa did mention that. All of us need to be entrepreneurs. I don't think we have a choice, colleagues. Um, I don't think we have a choice. We all need to be entrepreneurs um, because entrepreneurs are innovators. They are the ones that uh, source new ideas and above all, they solve problems. And I think uh, Dr. Murimbika did mention the steps uh, that you can take to do that. Uh, and I always like to say, we all need to be entrepreneurs following my good friend, uh, Chimamanda Adichie, uh, a poet and a writer uh, uh, from America, but you know, from Nigeria, who always says we all need to be feminists. Uh, but this is not the topic for today, but we all need to be entrepreneurs. So those are the four points if you have anything else. So let me just quickly talk about my Udongo uh, story. Um, Udongo started um, as um, a way of solving your problem. And uh, the problem I was trying to solve was not even cleaning, I can tell you, <laughs> because I'm not one of those that like to clean or a sparkling clean house. Uh, it was purely because I wanted to save money. <laughs> and um, I used to spend a lot of money, uh, you know, using many products. I used to have towel cleaner, windowlin, you know, dishwashing stuff and many other products. And uh, one day my domestic help told me that Mom, you are spending quite a lot of money um, on, on these products. Actually, you can uh, have a product that will help you save money, but also give you the same results uh, that you're looking for. So give me 20 rands. I gave her 20 rands and she came 
uh, with a pine uh, pine gel. If you can see the one right on the on the top, right next to my my Odongo box. So this pine gel is very popular. It is a green gel. It's a multi-purpose. You can use it for your cleaning your car. You can use it for your floors. You can use it for your windows. You can use it for your surfaces. You can use it for bathtubs, your toilets. It is multi-purpose and it's got a disinfectant as well. So that's how I bought this product. I started using it. Everybody who came to my house kept on asking me, well, your house smells nice. Your tiles look uh, really special. That photo, by the way, shows you where we started. I started packing them from my garage. Um, and I think Dr. Griff said that entrepreneurs start really small, but sometimes they stagnate. We did, we did not stagnate. Uh, so we, we, after having the pine gel, a light bulb moment came to me and um, I realized that I couldn't make a business out of this because there was demand for it. And so I ended up, um, you know, in 2015, uh, started registered the company in Zambia. Um, and I think uh, like Dr. Grief said, um, when I started, it was out of passion, but passion is not enough. Uh, it's, it's not enough. So 2015, when I started in the first year, we failed <laughs> terribly. We failed. We couldn't, we didn't have, uh, we had no uh, market uh, uh, knowledge. We had no audience, target audience analysis. We had very little funds. We uh, did not even know uh, how to do bookkeeping. So uh, the money came into my personal account in the evening when we sell a few uh, containers, we swipe it for bread or you know, for uh, a pair of shoes and so on. And so we could not recapitalize. We could not restock uh, the business and that's how it failed. Um, and I think, you know, for many entrepreneurs, I can tell you that um, it is painful, especially when you have the passion and you're so excited, you believe in it, but what you believe in, I may not believe in it. So um, we went underground and then did a bit of research. Uh, like I said, passion is not enough. Hard work and research does pay when you want to start uh, being an entrepreneur. I went underground, did a bit of research and 2017, I relaunched uh, the, the business. And this time around, um, I had a marketing plan which we used generously and diligently. Uh, I put together a small team. Um, I have a, a sales manager, sales and marketing manager, a part-time accountant with a functioning bookkeeping financial accounting system. It's basic for an entrepreneur like myself, but it works. It can show you the numbers and numbers do not lie. And then um, on top of that, um, I also made sure that uh, we have a physical store where people can actually access the products. So for Zambia, we have a physical store and for South Africa, we have an online uh, store. So context again matters. Uh, there are some contexts like in Zambia where online is still very far, but in a country like South Africa, um, it becomes quite easy to use online. So in 2017, um, Odongo Empowerment was also born because I saw the need for me to make money, but also empower others along the way. And this is nothing but, you know, um, um, an, an initiative that is helping women and youth between the age of 18 to 65 to begin their own Udongo business. And what happens is that we give them our products, which are environmentally friendly, affordable, and multi-purpose at factory prices, ridiculously low. You can start an Udongo business with as low as 500 kwacha, which is in, in South Africa to be like almost, you know, 600 rands or so, uh, or even, in fact, even, even less now with the exchange rate uh, that, that we have now, uh, which is almost equivalent to like $30, as low as $30, and you would make close to 70, uh, 80% uh, profit. So we have about 400 women since 2000 and 2015, we have about 400 women that have signed up on the empowerment uh, program and are helping their own families. They are making, some of them have quit their jobs because it's better to be an Udongo business uh, owner than being an, a receptionist and earning 1,500 when they can make between, one, between 500 to 1,000 kwacha uh, in a week. And when it's very good, they can even go more than that. So they're restocking constantly. They're restocking constantly. And this is what, you know, entrepreneurs should be, they should be adding value, like uh, Doc was saying, adding value, not necessarily to the products, but also to people's lives. You know, if you can change a life in your work as an entrepreneur, I think, you know, that is a, a big plus. So um, we have packages for uh, different entrepreneurs. You can start as low as 500, you can go as, as much as 5,000. We have in our database some women who have teamed up uh, to get 
the uh, ultimate uh, platinum package, which is about 5,000, but lots of products. So they can switch and match depending on, you know, the networks that they're selling the products to. So the primary people that they sell the products to are the people within their own vicinity, if their church, where they are sweeping in the church, cleaning in the church, they sell that to them. You know, the restaurants nearby, it's their friends and family, you know, it's at the rest, the, the, the supermarkets nearby where they are. And these are some of the clients that we have that um, have been coming to Udongo and uh, restocking uh, their products. This all thing sounds quite exciting and, you know, hunky-dory, but there are challenges, I can tell you that. Um, we, we have, like you can see on the, uh, on the screen there, we've got some of our products in supermarket shelves competing with the big brands, um, you know, so we, we're really trying to, to get that market share as well. But it's very difficult, especially when you have established brands. How do we compete with the other brands that have been known for years, and then you have this Udongo coming on the market? We're not losing hope anyway, but um, the other challenges uh, from a, a perspective as a woman um, and working full time, it is very difficult, I can tell you, to balance, um, you know, the side hustle as well as your uh, day job. Um, and I think it's, it's very important to be cognizant of the time that you use on your uh, side hustle so that you do not uh, you know, undermine one or the other. So um, balancing it, especially as a mother, and now with COVID, you know, online schooling with the children, uh, trying to, to be a mom, a wife, and, you know, a community worker, and also do donga business can be a challenge sometimes. But one thing I want to tell you is that uh, more recently, I encountered uh, a challenge around uh, people asking that, um, who, is, who is behind Udongo? Is there a big company that is behind it? Um, and, you know, so managing those perceptions about a woman run successful business can be a challenge sometimes because people think that only men businesses succeed. Um, and um, society needs to be really kind to us because women can also run successful businesses. If, you know, governments can invest in them, individuals and uh, 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 society can also invest in women businesses, I think will yield quite a, a lot uh, as a society uh, at large. Uh, the last challenge I think I wanted to talk about is uh, sometimes you don't have money to recapitalize. Um, you know, you go to a bank, you're a small uh, uh, hustle, and they're asking you for collateral, the, you have to fill in, you know, long forms, and then they, it takes forever for you to actually uh, you know, get that funding. So it becomes very difficult to run uh, the side hustle. Uh, so those are just a few challenges. We can talk more, but to end, I just want to say that um, being an entrepreneur is not child's play. You need to put in the hours um, and make the money and empower others along the way. And then identify a problem uh, and solve it in a way that makes you better and makes the society or the environment in which you are better as well. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much, Baba. I was about to disturb you. So I heard you saying the last part. Thank you very much for that. Also for sharing the fact and being honest that it wasn't easy, that you started off with virtually nothing and it didn't work the first couple of years. You had to go back and revamp and bring it back to the market um, after rethinking it. So I think a lot of times, once we failed, we just give up. So thank you for being honest and, and putting that out for our audiences. So we have one more speaker and then we are going to open the floor and allow you to, to engage with our speakers. Any questions that you have for Barbara, you can post right now on the chat um, as we introduce our next speaker. So the last of our speakers is another entrepreneur. Her name is uh, Sheila Afari. She does a lot of things. She's multi-talented and um, has also invested in a lot of things. She does public relations, music plugging, property investments, events management, media publishing. It's like an entire list. She is not slowing down by no means. And all of this started when she was in university. So I'm gonna hand over to Sheila. Let's hear her story and her journey and where she is today. Um, Sheila Afari, Rebusana. Thank you, Kira. 
why we should believe in entrepreneurship. I think there's no doubt about it. And my previous colleagues have just reiterated the importance of entrepreneurship. I'd like to take you through, you know, why we need to be in this space, just touching on my background, then looking at today's reality, and then the role of entrepreneurs in shifting the narrative of Africa today. I grew up typical African, you know, household. The expectation was that I would go to school, go to university, find a job. You know, that's kind of the trajectory of how things happen. And whilst I was at university, literally one day I was walking on campus and I stepped on a flyer that was advertising an entrepreneurship week. And it just packed my interest. I had never thought of being an entrepreneur before, um, but somebody just told me, you know what, just attend. And I was completely blown away by the amount of students that were running their own businesses. Some of them were even paying their own university fees, their siblings' university fees, and it was just unheard of. So during this entrepreneurship week, I learned how to register a business, just the kind of you know, step-by-step -step guides of you know, starting your entrepreneurial journey. And one of the speakers had mentioned that you know, in the way today's climate is, you want to start a business from something that's your hobby, something that you can use your two hands and two feet to start that has, you know, you're not using any capital, you're trying to pay rent for a store. So that kind of got me thinking, okay, what can I do to try to generate money that doesn't cost me anything? And even though I didn't want to start an events company, that just kept coming up in my mind um, because I had was involved in a variety of you know, societies and in those roles, there was some form of event organizing. So I thought, okay, cool, let me start an events company. And because we had learned how to register the company and the name came to me literally one day, I registered the company that week. I had no intention of you know, starting the business immediately. I thought I would just park it and one day you know, I could use the company. And a, a bank, one of the banks gave a talk as well during that week and gave an example of one of their clients that became a multi-millionaire from selling tomatoes at a taxi rank. So sometimes when we think about entrepreneurship, we're thinking, you know, are we inventing the next Facebook? We're thinking very kind of high level, but, you know, making money can be the really practical things on a day-to-day basis, you know? So what's the needs around you? What's the needs in your community? So kind of really broke it down that you don't need this you know, million dollar idea to start a business and to make money. Then that Saturday, um, we had kind of a closing dinner and they had invited some established entrepreneurs to network with our students. And the man sitting next to me asked me, what do I do? So I said, I own an events company. I literally registered like two days before that. And he said he had an event coming up, would I like to, to organize it? And I said, yes. As a student then, I understood that he was giving me an opportunity. He knew I wasn't, you know, I didn't have all these years of experience behind me, um, but I recognized opportunity and decided to go for it. So my very first event was for this multimillionaire at his penthouse in Seapoint in Cape Town. And that kind of sparked my entrepreneurial journey to get started. I often say um, my entrepreneurial journey was an accidental one. It wasn't planned, I kind of just fell into it. Um, but, you know, it was spurred on by recognizing opportunity, kind of putting out there that this is what I do. And before I knew it, people on campus were asking me to, you know, do their 21st birthday parties, then eventually migrated to raise formals. And then, you know, post varsity went to weddings and other kind of larger events. So, you know, it's, I kind of stepped into that entrepreneurial space and just kind of owned it. I wasn't looking to make money. I was a student, um, but I was getting something started and I was able to make mistakes along the way without feeling the, really feeling the brunt of it. Um, as a student, you know, I didn't have any children. I didn't have any huge financial responsibilities. So even my pocket money, I was able to invest into my business, you know, while friends are shopping, you know, for clothes and buying takeouts, I'll use my pocket money to, you know, have business cards made. Um, and a website. So I attended lots of networking functions, lots of entrepreneurial, you know, networks and businesses. Just kind of learn from other people and their journeys. And that really helped me in mine. Um, 
being an entrepreneur can be a very lonely journey and can be tough. And having, you know, understanding that people have gone through certain things that are similar to you or worse than you, you, you don't give up easy because you know that, you know what, you know, you'll get through this hurdle and, you know, the grass um, does eventually get green. So that kind of, you know, was my start to my entrepreneurial journey. And every business I've started after that has really been just spotting opportunities and going for it. Um, as Barbara alluded and, you know, other speakers, you know, the journey isn't always easy, um, but it's something I've kind of just persevered in. And, you know, if we look at today's, you know, realities. So I studied at UCT. UCT is considered, you know, the best university on the continent. And I had classmates, not classmates, I didn't study with them, but, you know, people who were with me at university and other faculties graduated cum laude from like accounting, um, you know, your, your BCOMs, sitting at home jobless. So when that reality hits that, okay, I can be from the best university, I can graduate top of my class and still not have a job. And when that reality hits, you realize that, okay, you know what? We can no longer have the mindset of go to school, go to university, have someone employ you because that reality may very well not come to pass. So yes, go to university. Like university is, was an experience that I would, I would forever treasure. I learned so much at university, you know, where I think, I, the way I'm able to challenge certain things, I believe I got those skill sets at, at university. But we need to have, be able to have a bit more of an open mindset around, you know, education when you're learning and not just expecting to transfer our skills into someone else's business, but say, how can I use this in my own? So that comes to the next thing about being an entrepreneur and, you know, how does that help shift the narrative in Africa and move Africa as a continent forward? Um, our Madam Facilitator Kara mentioned in the opening that, you know, Africa is not poor. And we currently had a back, you know, footing of, you know, what's happened to the continent and to change the narrative of Africa, to see Africa be considered rich and to see people on the continent, you know, thriving and, you know, being prosperous, it's actually a responsibility of everyone to say, how do I play a part? So if you're someone who wants to be a change maker, someone who's interested in generational wealth, someone who wants to eradicate poverty on the continent, whatever that may be, if you have the best interest of Africa at heart, you should look to start a business and say, you know, how do I, by me selling, you know, my cleaning products or by me selling tomatoes at a taxi rank, you might only be employing one person, but that chain of how many people's lives you affect is phenomenal. So, you know, different suppliers are involved. You know, if you eventually have an accountant, you, you know, you have someone who's doing your website, you are contributing to a lot of people. And the more people that can get into, you know, the industry and be able to give two rand, 200, 2 million to different, you know, supply chains, it makes a difference on the continent. Uh, we have two minutes, Sheila. Okay. One of you know my goals as an entrepreneur is to be able to encourage other people to take this journey. And I remember when I was at university and I'd go to um, you know these seminars and people be speaking about entrepreneurship, and you know someone's life really needs to be able to reflect to say, you know what, I've done this journey, I've walked it and, you know, come along. It's never that easy. And I would say I've been privileged in terms of how my entrepreneurship journey started. You know, being a student, not having the fear of what if I do this and it fails. So if you're in this position and you're questioning whether you should start, just start. You know, you don't need to, you know, raise huge capitals. You don't need to finish university first. You don't need to leave your job. You know, so like this, you know, talk today is called hustling or your side hustle. Treat it like that. Get, get your feet into the water, you know. So I just encourage everyone that, you know, whatever you're doing, whatever space that you're in, try to start something. And the easiest way to think about it is, okay, what's my hobby or what am I doing already that I can just monetize? I know people who have left corporate to run their side hustles because the side hustles started paying way more than their full-time jobs. 
cake businesses, you know, that have let, let people, you know, leave corporate catering, websites, so many different, you know, areas and, and um, expertise. So don't always think about, you know, do I need the next big idea that needs 10 million rand funding? Just start where you are. And, and I do quite a bit of mentorship and I always get the question of, I want to start this, but I don't have money. And for me, yes, practically you do need funding to kind of take your business to the next level or some kind of capital. But to get started, you should be the biggest investor in your business. So if you come to me for 100 rand and you can't even contribute 10 rand to your business, I'm not going to help you out. So just as I was a student, use my pocket money where I could have bought clothes or could have bought takeout, I use that to invest in my business. So just start where you are with whatever you have. And before you know it, the business will thrive and bring you back, you know, tenfold that and you can make a difference on the continent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, um, Sheila. Uh, what you're basically saying, we need to get over the fact that we don't have the intergenerational wealth. It's, you can wish and hope all you like. You need to create your own intergenerational wealth so that your children and your great grandchildren can benefit from your efforts today. Uh, my husband, Re Mohotzi, would be nodding vigorously. He's listening to, to you, would agree very much with everything that you have said. So now we are going to, to open up and uh, take your questions. We have already received some, so I'm gonna start with the ones um, that have come through. And uh, they are directed to the academics, Dr. Grieve and Dr. Murumbika. So Dr. Murumbika, Mike Edward, any suggestions for materials about marketing for a small business, especially one that is run by a young person? This question is from Michael Bofu, who's here with us today. Any suggestions for materials about marketing for a small business? Also for you, uh, Mark Edward, there's questions that were sent by Tavang, who's here with us today. What are some of the benefits for companies which fully support and embrace side hustling for their employees? Do the managers also think that employees who are side hustling can become preoccupied with their side hustle? So basically, what are some of the benefits for companies which fully support and embrace side hustling because you you are side hustling yourself. And then Dr. Grieve, a question for you uh, from Patrick Kayamba. How do we address customs barriers? And I suppose Barbara, you can also answer that because you sell in different countries. How can we address the customs barriers? So let's allow uh, the two academics to answer, then we'll take more questions after that. Shall we start with you, uh, Mike Edward? Or, or Dr. Grieve, if you're ready. Uh, just a second, Mike Edward, you're on mute, just a second. Okay, let's try. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I should be muted. All right. The the question on, uh, on 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 marketing for a small firm. The as a startup, the best marketing strategy you can have is network. People do business with people. Your network is your best form of marketing. You can go and hire the, the, the go and hire the most expensive advert space and all that and all that. But remember, this is space which is dominated uh, 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 by, like Papa said, these are spaces that are dominated by companies which are household names, and you are trying to take away market from them on the basis that you have found a gap. There's something else they are not doing which you can do better. So, as a startup, your best form of marketing is your network, word of mouth rather than spending, because you cannot afford to have the kind, if you hear the kind of budgets which these organizations put in marketing, you'll be blown away. So there's no need for you to spend large amounts of, of, of money uh, trying to run a marketing campaign against uh, established firms. Start from your network, 
start from your friends, your families and fools who support you to, for the business to grow. Then the word of mouth would, would grow. Your community, be it at, uh, at, at, your, at your church, be it at uh, your children's school, your, your brothers and sisters' school, wherever you have an opportunity of people to listen to you, use that. You should not be investing every penny you have. You said, I'm going to market as a small firm. Um, I, I think, um, and today it's much easier because of social media, we've got um, uh, several networks you could use to spread the word. That's the best form. That's what I would advise every startup. Do not invest an arm and a leg to run a marketing campaign. Start small, use your network. And in so doing, that's where also referrals come through and even more resources. Soon you start seeing people coming into even wanting a piece of that business. You see, you see, so start small and use your network to do that. Then on the question on um, corporate support for, for side hustling, it, it depends, which also speaks up to a question of ethics. Um, in entrepreneurship, when you're working and you start up an idea, which is similar to what you're doing at your job, then when it succeeds, whose idea is it? Uh, that becomes a, a, a challenge. Um, I remember uh, I was running, uh, I was running, I had a colleague who was running a, a firm called uh, Zumbululu, and, and we used to joke with our employees when they come in, they said, okay, we'll give you a contract as you are. Um, then one of our employees went and uh, got their appendix removed. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a medical process and it's, it's moved. And when she came back, we started saying, we want to reduce your salary because you're no longer the person we hired, you've lost something. Can no longer the person we have. It's it's all about those ethics. Thinking about whose idea is it? If I am going to use the company resources to develop my personal idea for the ideas which I'm employed to to do, that becomes personable. But for a lot of companies, if you look up at um, a lot of companies are coming up to this uh, point where they say innovation, innovation. You can't contract innovation. You can't tell people that we're employing you to be innovative or employing you in your contract, we're going to write creativity. It's, it's impossible because these things happen spontaneously. So encouraging people, creating an environment where people are more creative and more innovative in itself benefits the organization um, to a point where uh, 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 all innovation companies and all tech companies allow their employees to use company resources to come up with ridiculous ideas. For example, I know Google used to give the best prize for companies, for the person who comes up with the worst idea uh, in terms of it's highly innovative, but it's impossible. And you get a prize for that. So those who are in the know, the corporations which are, in, which are progressive, which, are, which encourages risk, which create an environment, they're happy with that uh, because it also brings value. Even myself, when I'm employing people, I would, like to, I would like to ask you, have you ever started anything? If you've never failed in business or on anything, it's difficult regardless of your qualification because I know you don't know how to handle failure, so I can't employ you. So it's, it depends and you need to understand your human, uh, human resources policies of the organization you're working with and how to go about it. And sometimes just ask for permission. I'd like to, to do this and, and see how that goes. If they're progressive, not a problem. Yeah, in fact, a lot of companies actually write a clause in your contract that you shouldn't do anything else outside of uh, what you've been contracted to do. So there's also needs to be a mind shift uh, with employers as well, that you can't eat and breathe them 24-7. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Murumbika. Yeah, one moment. You remember companies like, uh, do you remember a company called Kodak? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Kodak gave us the Kodak moment. That company invented the digital camera we're using today, which is not all over the phones, by their engineer, Samsung, in 1976. And they invoked that clause, which you have just mentioned. And they put that camera under the shed. In 2012, what happened to Kodak? They were disrupted and destroyed by the invention which their employer came from. The same goes, I can list you several companies which made similar mistakes of trying to control people into a point where you stop innovation. You will be punished. Thank you very much, Dr. Murimbika. Uh, Dr. Grieve, are you there to answer about the customs barriers? Barbara, you can also share your experience, how you overcome customs. Um, Grieve or Barbara? Mute. Oh yeah, thanks a lot. So I was just on mute. And that's an excellent question. 
uh, right. I mean, one of the constraints we know from the literature is that one of the constraints to the growth of entrepreneurial firms is market access. And I think this question about custom barriers is an excellent one. We've got 1.3 billion of us on the African continent. And due to the fact of the long historical legacy of colonialism, our markets are likewise segmented. And this is why the continent of free trade area is a great move in that direction because it potentially gives Barbara, uh, you know, and Sheila access to 1.3 billion uh, customers. So really what I can say from the question is that yes, customs barriers are really uh, hindrances to firm growth. And we, the, the hope is that this, um, the continent of free trade area opens up this market to 1.3 uh, billion uh, Africans. The one point I just want to say very quickly is that we need to realize the role of the public sector in encouraging entrepreneurs, right? So in this particular case, in accessing markets. And I think uh, part of the, 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 the conception of entrepreneurship is very individualistic in the way we think about it on the African continent. We think about it in terms of I, 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 but we need to think about the positive impacts of entrepreneurship in the larger society, which necessitates large scale public intervention. All these things that Barbara, Sheila, uh, Mark Edward have mentioned about the challenges of entrepreneurship. Many of them are personal. Many of them are due to the fact that there's no public support. So we really need to think about public support because it's incredibly crucial. Uh, that was going to be my submission. I just want to make that point that we need to think about entrepreneurship as a public thing. The way we invest in healthcare, the way we invest in education, we also need to invest in entrepreneurs and think about the benefits of entrepreneurship accruing beyond just Sheila, and Barbara to everybody else. We are all better for it because we've got Barbara making her cleaning products. We're all the better for it because Sheila is doing what she's doing. They're creating jobs, they're adding value, and we need to support them from the public point of view. That's the argument I was going to make. The converse of that very quickly is just to say that failure is not a function of personal defects. I think in our setting, failure is largely the function of the absence of public support. And I think uh, entrepreneurial groups need to be advocating for public support. We need the public to support our entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, that's, that's all from my, my side. Thank you. So the last questions that we have uh, from, from Tabang. Barbara, the question to you, are you likely to leave your company because you do have a full-time job? Are you likely to leave that full-time job once your Udongo becomes financially sustainable? And then back to Mark Edward again, what are some of the global best practices of organizations that support side hustling for their employees? And what kind of support do they provide? So do you have any examples of best practice organizations that do allow side hustles? And what kind of support do they provide? And then back to grief, um, has COVID-19 fast tracked the growth of side hustling? And, and entrepreneurship. Has COVID-19 fast-tracked the growth of side hustling and entrepreneurship? Before you answer, I want to recognize, oh, her hand is gone now. Martina Jane, Jane will allow you to ask your question and then uh, please make it very brief and then the, uh, we'll take the responses from there. Martina Jane. Martina Jane Karibu Sana. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. The sound was quite bad, but it sounds like the question is, is for you, Barbara. So Barbara, Mark Edward, and, and Grieve, you also you all have questions to answer. Let's start with uh, Mark Edward. Mike Edward, should I repeat your questions? Uh, 
All right. I was waiting for the unmute. Um, when you think of um, corporations which uh, support side hustling, mostly in um, your, your high growth, which are called high growth entrepreneurial ventures, um, it's common practice across uh, all industrial parks that um, if you think of the biggest and easiest ones, you think of um, a, 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 a company like Apple, um, they are very aware Apple do not come up with, uh, uh, with things which you find up on the market. What they, they know very well that if people are going to be creative, they have to give them the space and support them. So they run all these internal competitions where you are given time to go and come up with your own ideas uh, and, and, and come back and present them and, 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 and prizes are given. And people would have to make a decision whether they would uh, create a venture out of that idea and come back to provide that service to, uh, to a company like Apple. The same goes with your Google, the, 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 the Alphabet as a group. They do the same. They understand very well that if we restrict people, you restrict creativity. So they allow you to, they even give time. Other people are even allowed, are, are only, even when offices were open, they were only allowed to come up to the, they were only given time to come to the campus four days a week and you've got a 50 day. The only condition they would put is, you must account for that day. What did you do with the 50 day? You know, because we are paying you for 40 hours a week, but we, we allowed you, we only come for 32. What did you do with the eight hours? So many companies which understand the value of innovation are, are adapting to, 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 that, to, 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 to that form to a point where you also, even youngsters, when you're going up into uh, getting up a job and all that, looking at an environment where you even negotiate a contract which, say, which, which, which allows you to have that freedom to understand what is it that I'm going to do, what is company property and what is not. And companies now understand very well that you can't continue having such examples like Vodacom fighting one of the employees who came up with the SMS uh, call me back systems and all that. They've now learned quite a lot of lessons and things are changing, particularly in the high growth and tech companies because creativity cannot be forced. Creativity is something which people do spontaneously. So you can't contract it. So that clause of simply saying, don't do this, you can't do anything else, it's falling away in all progressive companies. And those which are not, a list of them are falling up because people leave and go elsewhere. Is it? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murumbika. Um, Dr. Grief, before you answer, I just want to throw in one more question that's coming from Rob Raberife. Rob says, how best do we as an African continent invest in our own infrastructure such that we reduce outsourcing from the Western world, but we turn the cycle around? So how best can we as Africans invest in our own infrastructure and reduce the cycle and dependency and outsourcing from the Western world? So I'll give you a minute to think about that. Uh, Barbara, if you can come on and answer your questions uh, from Martina and also from Tabang. Thank you, uh, Kara. Uh, unfortunately, I did not hear the, uh, the question from Martina. Uh, if you could type it in the chat, I'll be happy to, to answer it. Uh, I just wanted to touch a little bit on the customs barriers. Um, SADC has got a protocol on um, trade um, where they allow for small scale farm, small uh, mid to medium enterprise entrepreneurs to actually get their products across the borders um, duty free. But I must say that um, the process is very laborious. And even when say, for example, our truckers uh, get to the border, you know, some of the officers don't even know about that protocol. They keep saying, no, you have to pay. We don't know about it. So it creates such a challenge because the application of that protocol is not consistent. So you end up with all of these, you know, delays and all of those things. Uh, and I think from what Dr. Greaves had said, I think we need a deliberate investment in uh, entrepreneurs and to remove these barriers that um, small uh, scale entrepreneurs like ourselves uh, are facing. Would I leave my job if my Odongo business uh, boomed? Why not? Definitely. Why would I stay in a job when I'm getting 10 times more? Does it make economic sense? Business sense? Hell no. Um, I would definitely uh, uh, move, but um, with the caveat that um, I would live well. Uh, and I know if I leave, 
I will create more jobs. I'll create a space for others to come in in that uh, position and also contribute to the greater um, uh, economy, as Dr. Grieve have said. Uh, just quickly, Kara, on the uh, COVID. Um, I hope my boss is not on the call. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> COVID fast tracked, um, you know, business definitely, particularly for me who's in the cleaning detergents uh, business. Um, you know, James knows no boundaries. James knows no color, and so uh, with our cleaning products, with the sanitizers, the bleach, and the pine fresh gel, they have actually skyrocketed. Those are the three products that are actually gone off the roof because everybody wants to make sure that they uh, are in an environment that is germs free. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. So um, just to close now, because we are running out of time, Dr. Grieve, I'll ask you to answer your question. There's one last question. You may answer it if you can, Dr. Grieve. If not, I'll ask Sheila to, to address this question in your closing comments. So the first one is, how can we go about formulating accounting systems for a small business without any background of accounting or, fi of, or finance. And that's from Michael Mpofu. And then the last question from my husband, Remo Hodzi is asking, um, this conversation is important. We have lots of resources. That's why the Western world comes to harvest them from Africa. We need to plan around introducing this at schools and grow these ideas in our children whilst they're still young. So that's a, a comment, not a question. If you can address the question on accounting systems, Dr. Grieve, in your closing comments, and then Sheila will give you the last word. Um, thanks so much, Kara. Very quickly, I think the question of Now, I'd like to respond to very quickly is the one about COVID and side hustling. I think it was an important question. Um, has, um, has COVID in, in, in increased side hustle? So in the African case, we need to think very quickly about how economies are structured. So we have a very firms hire just enough employees. Can you hear me? Uh, the network is giving issues, but let's hear. Okay, thank you so much. I will just turn off my video for this. So the, the way uh, the firms operate in the formal sector is they had just enough employees Unlike our friends in the West, where the formal sectors tend to be bloated, quote unquote, uh, such that what happens in these kinds of environments is that when there's a recession, very quickly, uh, the people are laid off, right? Uh, and then rehired when the economy grows. In our setup, the formal sectors are just enough workers. So we haven't seen massive layoffs from the formal sector, but certainly what we have seen is uncertainty about the future. So I just give an example, uh, the likes of Bob Wright can imagine are pretty worried about what the future course of the economy will be like given that COVID is still around. And therefore I suspect a lot of thinking that people are gonna be laid off, but people are generally worried about the future course of events and we're all trying to diversify our sources of income. In Can you hear me? Are you done, Dr. Grief? Uh, okay, I'm almost done. I was just going to say quickly about the infrastructure thing and just say he's right. We need to invest in public infrastructure. We really need to take uh, public. Um, Sheila, I'll ask you to, to answer the question around building accounting systems if you don't have any background of that, because I'm not sure what you studied, but I'm sure you also had that challenge and also use this to make your closing comments. Sheila? Okay, about accounting systems, um, I also didn't really study accounting, I think probably grade 10. Um, there are lots of actually online um, programs where you can get you know, accounting systems for extremely cheap or free. Even most banks, you know, offer kind of that support. Um, but I would actually say, you know, find a fellow accountant. They might not be offering you services, but you can turn them into entrepreneurs saying, hey, listen, I'm starting a business. <laughs> can you help me one, two, three? Give me a good rate and let's get working. You can put me down as reference my business. So we start doing business with each other. The thing about systems and programs and things like that is you might be able to get the numbers in and punch stuff, but an accountant has insights and knowledge that you don't. 
So sometimes it's good to be able to, you know, converse and use an expert in the field. And we mustn't always think it's expensive. So support another small business, I would say, or otherwise, you know, go online, Google or consult your bank. Um, you will be able to get, um, you know, good programs that way. And just in closing, um, it was Dr. Grieve who mentioned in terms of public support for entrepreneurs is key. We are the public as well, you know, so we need to be able to support one another as entrepreneurs. We can't just think I'm on my solo journey and I'm just going to do my own thing. It's how do I, you know, um, um, Dr. McEdward mentioned, you know, networking as a good marketing thing, you know, referrals, word of mouth. So we need to, if your neighbor doesn't know you, what you're doing, you're not doing a good enough job. We need to vocally tell people what we're doing. And when people are telling us stuff, even if you don't need that service, make sure to always pass it along. So, it's, you know, we can always fight to advocate for public, you know, policies to change and, you know, for, you know, other kind of, you know, government support and things like that. But in our day to day, we as the public can make a difference in terms of shifting entrepreneurship forward, helping your neighbor, you know, you know, with something using their service, helping your fellow entrepreneur with something else. I think let's also remember as much as we're looking for public support, we're also the public and we should be, you know, advocating and supporting other entrepreneurs as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila, and to all our speakers. You will notice everybody was dressed in African attire. We really want to hold the African flag high. And we've taught you a few terms. If you're not familiar with Swahili, Karibu sana means welcome. When you're welcoming someone, Habari means uh, greeting also in uh, Swahili. So as we close, we are at the end now. We're just going to receive a vote of thanks and uh, we'll allow Mwanja to close the session for us. She is the founder of Being Africa in Africa Initiative. And she is the one that puts this webinar together. So we really want to encourage that because it's a side hustle as well. She is very much a part of this and could have been a speaker herself. So Mwanja Karibusana, please uh, close for us and um, say goodbye to the audience. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all our participants this evening. And I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the esteemed panelists that share their knowledge with us on the important topic of hustling and entrepreneurship, which is actually the bread and butter of the African economy. So there's no way of doing away with entrepreneurship. And actually when we did our dry run and during the session today, personally, I, I've been taking notes. I said, these are life lessons. And uh, I like the fact that uh, um, Sheila, for instance, said, just go for it, <laughs> just do it, if at all. So that, that will resonate with me for, for a long time to come. And Barbara said she started and then she, she went down, but then she got up again. So if you fail, carry on, keep on moving. And Grieve also pointed to, to a very important uh, aspect of, of policy to say that uh, compared to other parts of the continent, African countries, we, we don't really support, our, there's no deliberate public system in each and every country that supports uh, entrepreneurship. So that's an advocacy point through the job that I do. <laughs> through my, my career. And um, Dr. Mac Edward, you, you, you spoke um, quite a lot as well. Uh, you, you, you shared with us gems that will also stick with us. Um, there, there are a lot of tips, but one thing that will forever stay with me is the fact that you said, despite the challenges that we face, those challenges that we have are actually opportunities because those are needs that need to be overcome. So thank you very much to all our esteemed speakers. It's been a very engaging session. And uh, looking at the comments as well, people have also said that, that it's been very thought provoking. So there's a lot for us to, to, to digest. Last but not least, a person who's slowly becoming a very good friend of mine, if you allow me to say so, is our facilitator for this evening. I don't think that the discussion would have been successful if it wasn't for the sterling job that uh, Keratira did for us uh, this evening. Thank you very much, Keratira. A big hand to you. <laughs> I applaud you and uh, the Being African in African team also applauds you. And uh, thank you very much to, to, to your husband who's been with us this 
evening as well. Thank you, sir, you're most welcome. Participants, without taking too much of your time, I'd like to say that our next um, session will be in the month of March. We're going to explore African culture and heritage where we digest and throw in uh, different things, looking at our, at our heritage, our music, our food, our cultural norms, our traditions and our values, as well as the African identity already when we we're doing a, a, a rehearsed, uh, uh, when we had a rehearsed session, there was an argument to say that does the cloth you wear actually define you as an African? <laughs> what does that mean? So please be sure to, to join that discussion. Do look out for, for the advert in, in the emails and in our social media uh, platforms as well. And uh, we'll also be launching our first ever podcast called The African Pod in the month of February. So that's something that we're looking forward to. And a big thank you also to the team that works behind the scenes. I do not work alone. So thank you to the Being in African in Africa team. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and be blessed. Until next time, bye. Bye, Asante, Rale Boha.